All of these presentations have been yeah. I've certainly found them inspiring and uh, very powerful, so I appreciate it. I want to thank the uh, Community Renewal Society and uh, Dr. Curtis e. Young for inviting me to be with you today. It's really my honor to be with you this morning. Now, first, this is a very beautiful room, and I've heard some discussion about what what the alternative vision for America is, and I think it's right here in the room. All right. This is what America looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And on a beautiful day, this is what America can do. So, just for starters, I know I look white, I know I look like a white person. <laughs> but actually, I'm not, okay? I, I'm, I'm a fair skinned Latino. Wow. And uh, so I get lots of uh, white male privilege. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> until, until someone hears my name. <laughs> or hears me speak Spanish, uh, my native language, my first language. Or hears my ideas. And then it's different. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the. Uh, the white-black binary understanding of race in a way that might limit our understanding of Latinos. Then I'll talk a little bit about Latino history in the United States and some important things that Latinos and African Americans have in common. And I'll end with talking a little bit about coalition building. So what is the white-black binary that we've heard reference to? And basically it's a way of describing predominant social understanding of race in the United States, which treats race and race relations as though it was of concern only to blacks and whites. Now, there are very important historical reasons for this understanding, deeply rooted in the history of slavery and continuing racism. There's nothing wrong with that understanding. The only thing is that it's incomplete. It leaves out some people and some history that, that I think are relevant. I hope I'll be able to persuade you of that. Uh, I think it limits the understanding of Latinos and their relationship to American racism. If one relies on the media, one would think that Latinos are all Hispanics, mm. are white and Cuban and conservative. Uh, after all, we had two Hispanic Republican candidates for president mm. until Trump won. And this was both remarkable and weird, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, on the other side, one often hears references, and, and I think this is racist, you know, to the sleeping giant. Latinos as the so-called sleeping giant. Well, we're not asleep. Right. And we also hear you know, scary depictions of demographic change, so many Latinos growing, and, and of course we hear a lot about the alleged problems posed by undocumented immigrants. Uh, the media and society generally basically ignore Latinos, except to describe them as criminal immigrants. And people assume also that all or most Latinos are very recent vintage, and this isn't true. Uh, very few people know anything really about Latino history in the United States. It's a history of victimization through racism, conquests, stolen lands, and exploitation. It's also a history of civil rights struggles a struggle against segregation in schools, theaters, parks, swimming pools in the Southwest. Jim Crow had his first cousin, Juan Crow, in the Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a lot of you know. There was a very important case called Mendez v. Westminster from California in 1947. In this case, Mexican American and one Puerto Rican parents challenged school segregation in Orange County, California. Their children weren't allowed to go to the white school. And so they went to a lesser school. And the parents challenged this and won, in an opinion that's strikingly similar uh, to Brown versus Board of Education. This is in 1947. Now, significantly, Frederick Marshall and Robert Carter and Lauren Miller of the NAACP filed an amicus brief in that case, urging the desegregation of Orange County, California. They knew what was at stake. This is the case in NSV Westminster, was actually the first case to declare Plessy v. Ferguson unconstitutional. It's at the federal district level. But it was, so it's actually the first, and then Brown versus Board of Education is more important because the Supreme Court doing that. Nonetheless, 
Latinos were involved directly in civil rights struggle against segregated schools and other forms of segregation. Here's some demographic reality about Latinos. Cubans are only 3.5% Latino community. Think about that. 97%, 96.5% of Latinos are not Cuban. <laughs> Yet, probably most of you have only heard, this is true, the media depicts mostly white Cubans. So this is disturbing. Uh, Mexican Americans constitute 63% of the Latino population. It's overwhelmingly the largest community. Right. Puerto Ricans constitute 9.2%. Also, a very, very large segment of the Latino community. I want to talk for a moment about net worth, okay? Uh, you'll see how I'll tie this up. Net worth, of course, is the amount of wealth that families have. And in the United States, white families, as a median, have around $141,900 in wealth, in net worth. So half of white families have more than $142,000, approximately, and half of white families have less. Now, for African Americans, the corresponding figure is $11,000. Half of African American families have more than $11,000 in wealth, but 50% of African American families have less than $11,000 in wealth. This is 7.75% of the total for white families. And this is largely due to white racism. This is a major part of the systemic racism we've been talking about. Now, Latinos have about $13,700 in wealth. So this is also a very small number. It's a little higher than the number for African Americans. It's only 9.65% of the white total. So Latinos also are quite impoverished. Latinos share deep concerns about mass incarceration, inadequate education, and the artificial restrictions imposed by racism. I think it's fair to say that in the present, Latinos as a group are slightly better off than African Americans. But only slightly. And it's important to keep that in mind. Often people say they're taking our jobs with respect to undocumented immigrants. And I would ask you just to consider that it's white business owners who do the hiring. <laughs> They're accepting jobs, but the jobs are being offered by white business owners in the overwhelming majority of cases. So this is actually a, a symptom and manifestation of white racism. I think if Latinos understood better the depth of unfairness experienced by African Americans, perhaps they would care more about the dismal outcomes many African Americans face. They would care more about fairness. With respect to our communities, and I know I need to stop, I just, just one last word. There's a lot of mistrust between our communities. And in the first instance, it's well-founded. Trust takes relationships and time, and we can only trust people who walk the walk over time. I think our goal can be that everyone have their fair share of society's best opportunities. And fairness is not a zero-sum game. It's not either me or them. It's for everyone, it's for all of us. It's so important to reach across and to care about the history and welfare of groups other than one's own. Latinos must learn about and appreciate the great depths of African American history and struggles for justice. And African Americans must learn that some, perhaps many, Latinos can be trusted as allies for justice, and that not all Latinos may be latecomers to civil rights struggle. Improved understanding provides a firmer foundation for more constructive relationships and coalition building. Coalition building and better understanding have always been crucial, but as current times grow darker, it's more important than ever for us to work together against the, the culture that oppresses us all. Thank you very much.